uh, ranging from frustrated magnets and uh, Bose, <coughs> Bose condensation, which, will, uh, which is a topic we'll hear today, uh, to multi-heroics, uh, spin transfer, uh, magnonics, uh, some non abelian excitations I saw recently, and uh, superconductivity. And so uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here. So Christian has received his uh, <coughs> uh, PhD in uh, 1996 from uh, 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 in Argentina. <laughs> 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 he told me the, the name nicer than the institute's name, but it's a uh, uh, it's a I guess atomic physics center right. uh, in Argentina. I thought their specialty they were skiing. Yes, well, <laughs> like I here. Didn't, well, yes, okay. I didn't say he didn't. Know, so. <laughs> so, so and then uh, uh, in 2000 he went uh, uh, to uh, Los Alamos as a director's postdoc and actually stayed there ever since. And then last year he has become a staff member. No, in 2004. 2004, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Just ten years ago, uh, <laughs> and, uh, he has become a staff member there, and uh, and so you know, continues uh, doing great uh, work uh, and of uh, great variety. And so he is not teaching, which is interesting. <laughs> but uh, that is <laughs> working on his list of publications, and as I think he wishes he would be teaching. So in this March meeting, which is next week, I can. Uh, while composing the schedule of the talks I would like to see, to, to see there next week. Uh, so I, I checked uh, Christian's talks and he has 11 presentations. Uh, and so, yeah, some, some teaching would help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce Christian. Thank you very much, Oleg. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Oleg, uh, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Salt Lake City. And I have been really enjoying all the stimulating discussions today with many of you. So I hope to keep you know discussing tomorrow. So today I would like to to tell you a story about you know the emergence of magnetic vortex crystals in, in frustrated mode insulators. Probably you are all very familiarized with the abricots of vortex crystals that you can get in superconductors. So what I would like to show you today is that it is also possible to get you know vortex crystals in you know in magnetic systems. So basically the magnetization forming vortex uh, patterns. And, and this is a work that we did in collaboration with uh, Yoshi Camilla. Yoshi used to be in Los Alamos. I mean, he was there as a postdoc for three years, and now he's in Riken in Japan. Um, so, so we did this work to, uh, together. And you know, I'd like to illustrate you know, the, you know, uh, the, this kind of work you know, with this nice picture of Escher, where you can see how you know, from a very simple uh, microscopic interactions, you know, like, you know, the triangular pattern is basically the paradigm of frustrated systems, you can have, you know, complex states emerging at a different landscape. So this is a story, uh, you know, that is uh, basically described by this picture. And, and there are three concepts that I will be invoking along the talk. So I will combine three, three different concepts to arrive to this, you know, magnetic vortex crystals. So one is the notion of Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, the second one is uh, frustration. Uh, in a few words, you know, competing interactions. So if you combine this concept with this other concept of competing interactions, uh, plus quantum fluctuations, you can end up with, you know, these uh, complex states, uh, as you will see, you know, you can get different kinds of uh, vortex crystals in, in, in mod insulators. And I will explain later on what I mean by, by a mod insulator. So uh, let me start with the first uh, concept, the first notion, Bose-Einstein condensation. So this is a notion that, as you probably all know, uh, started in 1924 when these two gentlemen uh, basically noticed that, you know, if you take an ideal gas of bosons below a certain temperature, uh, they will condense. I mean, particles will condense. That means that, you know, the single particle ground state will develop a microscopic occupation. And, and a few years later, uh, Fritz London actually connected, you know, uh, was the first one who noticed that there could be a connection between you know, this notion of post einstein condensation and these two important phenomena that were discovered around this, you know, <coughs> well, superconductivity was discovered in 1911 uh, and, you know, super, superfluid 
uh, helium, you know, that was also known by them. So he, he suggested that, you know, this, you know, what was, whatever was happening in this, with these two phenomena was related to bose einstein condensation. And, and, and bose einstein condensation remained, uh, you know, as a, you know, very stimulating topic, you know, it remained fascinating, the different generations of physicists, and as we all know, uh, these three gentlemen got the Nobel Prize in 2001 for uh, basically producing uh, BEC of rubidium atoms in, in traps. But something that is common to all these different realizations, if you want, of bose einstein condensation of some nature, is that uh, in all of these cases, this, the, the particles are condensing in a single particle state that, first of all, has well-defined momentum, and, and that momentum is zero. Right? So, so here, you know, the particles are condensing in a single particle state with zero momentum, and you know, normally in superconductivity, unless you're thinking of F -F -F, you know, for, full de ferrer larkin of Chinnikov states that you know, are difficult to find in nature, you also have you know, condensation at, at k equals zero. The same is true for superfluid he helium. So uh, what I want to do now is, is show you a, another possible incarnation of a gas of bosons, right, where you can naturally uh, produce uh, single particle dispersions, kinetic energy of a single particle with several minima, instead of having a single minimum at k equals zero, which will lead to a Bose-Einstein condensation at k equals zero, uh, you know, systems where you can have multi-minima in the single particle dispersion, in the si single boson dispersion. And then the question is, you know, how, how is that condensate? I mean, so in principle, bosons can condense in a linear combination of the different minima, and, you know, what determines, you know, what is the optimal linear combination. So let me introduce those systems. Uh, those are mod insulators, so probably you are all familiarized with the notion of a band insulator, right? Uh, in, a, in a single particle picture, when you describe a solid a crystal, you have a band structure. So basically, the energy levels of the electrons appear in bands. And as you all, is, is what it was noticed, you know, very early uh, in after you know development of quantum mechanics, is that you know this band structure can easily explain the insulating behavior because if you have a material that has an integer number. Of, of bands that are completely filled, uh, and then you know it has empty conduction bands. It is clear that you know there is a gap to any excitation. So if you want to conduct electricity, you will need to overcome this gap, and this this gap you know can be as big as you know one or two electron volts. So um, <clears throat> so this is a natural explanation for you know insulators. And as you can see, uh, there are no low energy, low energy degrees of freedom in this kind of materials because, uh, you know, both for the spin and the charge excitations, you need to overcome this gap. But a few years later, people notice even, you know, during those days that, you know, some of the materials were not fulfilling these conditions. So basically, they had the last occupied band was half filled instead of being completely filled. So the question was, well, why is that those materials are insulators? Uh, the answer came through different people, but you know, this is the man that is usually, uh, you know, normally we attribute, you know, that discovery to to to, to this gentleman, Neville Mott, that you know, basically uh, explained the insulating behavior by invoking the strong Coulomb repulsion within the same atomic orbital. So the idea is that now you have Let's say, uh, you know, the, the, the last band is, is half occupied, and now you have, let's say, one electron in each of these uh, valence orbitals. Uh, so now if you try to move an electron from an atom to the nearest neighbor atom, you, you know, that electron will have to double occupy the orbital, and there is a Coulomb energy, a large Coulomb energy barrier for, for, for that, uh, meaning that, you know, the Coulomb interaction in this case will be localizing you know, the electrons in each of the atomic orbitals. And as I said, there is one electron in each orbital to a good approximation. So uh, the spin of that electron now is still free to point up or down. So unlike the band insulators, in the case of multi insulators, uh, when the electrons are localized, there is still a low energy degree of freedom that is the spin, right? So you have two to the n states where n is the number of atoms. Right? And to see the further, those states have all the same energy. So uh, 
a simple model, a minimal model for for understanding uh, or describing these mod insulators is, is the so-called Havar model that contains two terms. One is a kinetic energy term that basically allows to, you know, is basically allows the, the electron to move from, from one ot the orbital of one atom to the nearest neighbor, right? So it's, it allows for this kind of process. And then uh, there is a Coulomb interaction, you know, the Coulomb interaction that I was invoking a moment ago to explain the insulating behavior. That tells us if you, that if you put two electrons in the same orbital, all right, there is a penalization, there is this energy cost U. So it's that energy barrier that basically makes the system an insulator. And, but of course, and as I was saying, you know, the spin, you know, to zero further, if you put the hopping to zero, basically if the hopping is exactly zero, if there is no kinetic energy, then you know you have two to the n uh, degenerate spin states. But as soon as this hopping becomes finite, which is you know, the realistic situation, you can do perturbation theory in the ratio between T and, and U, that is the dominant interaction. And to lowest order, you will have this kind of processes, right? The electron can visit the neighbor and come back. But as you can see, it can only visit the neighbor if the two spins are forming a singlet, right? So only singlets will lower their energy. Meaning that if you develop some, you know, if you do, you know, uh, uh, degenerate perturbation theory, uh, the only thing that you have to do is you have to compute, you know, the to second order in T, the stabilization energy, I mean, the, the, the energy gained due to this process that I just described of the singlet, that is, let's call it minus J, J is 4 square, 40 square over, over, over U. So the only thing you have to do is, you know, you have to, sum over all the bonds, you know, count the singlets, so S dot S minus 1 over 4 is 0 if you have a triplet. If you have a triplet because of the Pauli exclusion principle, there is no way of gaining any energy through a second order process. So this operator will be 0 because you get 1 over 4 minus 1 over 4. But if you have a singlet, uh, S dot S minus 1 over 4 is, is minus 1, right? Minus 1 times J is basically the energy gain, right, for each singlet that we have in. So that is basically the low energy effective model. Once you project uh, your your you know into the uh, you know your Hilbert space into the low energy uh, space of uh, spin states, and as you can see, this is you know the so-called Heisenberg model. Heisenberg introduced this model phenomenologically to explain you know ferromagnetism actually in 1928. Uh, but as you can see, you can derive this this model uh, from a Haber model. And the difference is that, uh, you know, now the exchange interaction is, is anti-ferromagnetic instead of ferromagnetic because it favors singlet states instead of triplet states. And here, you know, you can, you can see, you know, uh, that uh, the, the origin of this anti-ferromagnetic interaction is essentially the Pauli exclusion principle. So this interaction has a strong quantum character, right? It's something that, you know, it's, it's not a classical effect, it's a quantum effect. And, and it's in, indeed, you know, all the, you know, the reason why, you know, we can observe magnetic ordering in nature at ambient temperature, let's say, or even at higher temperatures, is, is completely quantum mechanical. It has to do with the Pauli exclusion principle. If you think of the classical interactions between magnetic moments, you know, that is the dipolar interaction. And dipolar interaction for the typical distance that you have in a solid, that is three angstroms, it will be a fraction of a Kelvin for typical magnetic moments. So, to understand, you know, the existence of magnetic ordering at ambient temperature, you need uh, to invoke quantum mechanics. And, you know, this is a simple example of how you can generate a strong spin-spin interaction via, you know, the Pauli exclusion principle. So, uh, so motor insulators normally are described, you know, uh, simple, you know, like the transition metal oxides are described, you know, uh, by, by this type of interactions, S dot S. So now, uh, let me add a magnetic field to this story, right? Uh, a Zeeman coupling to a magnetic field. And, and just to simplify the story, let's assume that uh, the magnetic field is, is very high, so all the spins become fully polarized. Right? So, so we end up with a ground state like this one, right? Where all the spins are pointing parallel to the magnetic field direction. And uh, what you can ask now is what happens, you know, what are the excitations of this, this state, of this ground state? So for that, you know, what you have to do is you have to flip a spin, right? 
And simply notice that when you write this s dot s interaction, you expand it in this way. You have sz, sz, the easing part of the interaction, plus this s plus, s minus. This kind of term, s plus, s minus, you know, can flip a pair of spins, so it allows you to move, right, this, this excitation, you know, from one side to a nearest neighbor. So again, you know, this excitation can propagate. So if you di diagonalize this <coughs> essentially single particle problem, you will end up with a quadratic dispersion, right? I mean, in, on a lattice, you will get a cosine like dispersion and a square lattice like this one. But, you know, for, you know, close to the minimum, it, it has a quadratic dispersion with a gap, and the magnitude of the gap is, is controlled by, by the magnetic field, right? So the, the bigger the magnetic field, the bigger the gap, because the higher the energy cost for flipping the spin, right? For you know, flipping the spin in the first place. And what you can see is that this single particle dispersion has a minimum at pi pi. That is so simply because you know, this hopping is positive. This, this hopping term is, is positive. And, and basically, what, what this indicates is that you know if you uh, if you were, if you decrease the magnetic field and eventually reach you know the gapless situation, the system will you know have an instability towards anti-ferromagnetism and not ferromagnetism. So that is the reason why you 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 get the minimum at pi pi instead of zero zero. So this is a very simple situation you know that happens in a square lattice and actually. You know, this is, I'm, I'm using this example simply to show you, you know, how you can map this problem essentially into a, into a gas of bosons, because now what you can do is you can rewrite your spin operators in terms of hardcore boson operators. Essentially what that means is, you know, I can map the spin up state into an empty state and the spin down into a state occupied by a hardcore boson. And what, what I mean by hardcore boson is that you cannot have more than one boson on that side, right? You need to, you know, you have a two-level system, so, you know, you, you need to end up with a two-level system, so that, that means that, you know, these bosons have a hardcore constraint. Essentially, you know, you can put it in, in a different way. You can say that, you know, there, there is an infinite repulsion, on-site repulsion for these, for these bosons. And, and now you can map, so, so you can rewrite your spin operators in terms of creation and annihilation operators of these bosons. And SZ basically ends up being a linear combination of one half and uh, the occupation number. And what is important to notice is that spin operators commute on different sites. So that means that these bosonic operators also commute on different sites, right? And that's the reason why I'm calling them bosons, right? So, so we can rewrite our original Heisenberg Hamiltonian simply in terms of a Hamiltonian for an interacting gas of bosons, right? Uh, the, the spin flip part of the Hamiltonian that I was using before for moving the, the, the spin excitation is basically this kinetic energy term. There is an offside density density interaction. They are hardcore bosons, so you know there is an infinite on-site repulsion, and there is a chemical potential that is controlled basically by the magnetic field. So this shows you how you know with this magnetic system, you know how these magnetic systems, if you want, are incarnations of gas of both gases, right? So, uh, as I promised before, I want to show you now that, you know, in these particular incarnations of both gases, you can have very peculiar single boson, single boson dispersions, in, in the sense that, you know, you can have situations in which instead of having a single minimum here, you have several minimum. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, before going into that, let me simply say that, you know, now one, after performing this mapping, right, the, this uh, single spin flip excitation, you know, becomes sim simply a single boson problem, right? If I, if I flip a single spin, I have now a single boson like, according to this mapping. And once again, this boson will propagate and, you know, it, it, it will have this kind of single boson dispersion on a square lattice. So, uh, <clears throat> So you can ask now what, what happens, you know, when, when you decrease the magnetic field and you go, you, you, you go beyond the critical field for closing the gap, right? So there is a critical field when you close the gap, that is the so-called saturation field. And if the field becomes a bit smaller than that, sat, than that saturation field, then you will start having bosons in the ground state, right? It's like, you know, in the original language, you will have spin flips or in the ground state. So essentially what you will get, have, you know, very close to that saturation field, what you will have is a dilute gas of, of bosons, right? 
And, and we know that, you know, for a dilute gas of bosons, uh, what will happen is that the system will undergo, indeed, a boson condensation below a certain temperature. Bosons will condense normally at this, you know, lowest single particle state, right? And if we now write down the, you know, the, the, the order parameter for the boson einstein condensate that is the mean value of B, right? In terms of the original spin operators, what you get is B is this linear combination of Sx and Sy, right? So the mean value of B is a complex number. So you can see that the real part of the complex number corresponds to Sx, and the imaginary part of the complex number corresponds to X, Sy. So what that means is that that both Einstein condensate back in the spin language corresponds to XY ordering, to magnetic ordering in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? The magnetic field was applied along the Z direction, and now you have a non-zero expectation value of the X and the Y components of the spin. And the phase of that, uh, you know, the, 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 the orientation of that XY magnetization is determined by this phase, right? So the phase, if you want, of this condensate is, is basically determined by, corresponds to the orientation of the, of the planar magnetization. That here is staggered magnetization, right? This Q is pi pi, simply because, you know, we have antiferromagnetic interaction. So basically, bosons condensing at pi pi corresponds to a staggered XY magnetic ordering in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. I notice that I can, I can talk about bosons and condensate for the moment because I'm using a Hamiltonian that conserves the number of particles. By the end of the talk, you will see that in any real material like this, there are terms that do not conserve the number of particles, so you have to abandon this you know, notion of bosons and condensation. Uh, but it is still very useful for, you know, from the computational point of view, as, as you will see in a moment. That is one of the comments. The other comment is that uh, you know, there is a universality class that is called bosons and condensation that you know, corresponds to this quantum critical point when you have this quadratic dispersion. And that can survive even in the presence of these anisotropic terms. So the fact that you know, the, the universality class of this critical point can remain the same, the same as what you will have if you had a continuous U1 symmetry, even when you have only discrete you know, four-fold rotational symmetries or six-fold. So, and you know, these are you know, two papers, one by Oleg. You know, he recently published this uh, review article uh, that you know talks about the, these kinds of systems, you know, in, in in the frustrated context that they will describe in a moment. So, so, so the, the the interesting story about you know these incarnations of both gases is that now if you put these bosons, I mean, if you have a, a system that instead of uh, having a square lattice, you know, um, it has a triangular lattice, right? And there are many of those materials that comprise a triangular lattice in their structure. Indeed, they are listed in in the OLEX review, then uh, uh, the interesting thing is that if you now go and compute the single boson dispersion, so you do the same thing, you fully polarize the system and, you know, you flip a single spin and, and compute the single, uh, the, the, the magnum dispersion, uh, you end up with uh, two minima. For instance, in this, in this case of a triangular lattice, you end up with minima at uh, this capital Q and minus Q. And these Qs are on the boundary of the Brillouin zone, meaning that there are only two inequivalent Qs. So these three Qs are the same because they differ by reciprocal lattice vectors. The same is true for minus Q. So there are only two minima in the single boson dispersion. And then the question that you can ask is whether these bosons will condense in a single minimum or in a linear combination of the two. And those two states, you know, will be different. Uh, the way you can see, you know, in, in the magnetic language, you know, you can see that, you know, there should be two minima is that, you know, these, these wave vectors correspond to this 120 degree ordering. Again, as you can see, is magnetic ordering in the plane perpendicular to the plane magnetic field. But now, because the system is frustrated, I mean, if the three interactions, if all the interactions are antiferromagnetic, there is no way of fully satisfying each of the bonds. Each of the bonds will, have, will like to have the spins oppositely aligned. You know, the, the, the best trade-off is, is to have a 120 degree angle, right, in each of the three bonds. That corresponds to this wave vector. This is the ordering that corresponds to condensation at this wave vector. But as you can see, if I move from, you know, from this side to this side, you know, the, the angle between these two spins could be plus or minus 120 degrees. And that is the difference between Q and minus Q, right? Those, 
these are two solutions with opposite chirality. So uh, if you have a situation like this one, right, where you have a single particle dispersion with two minima, uh, you may want to ask, okay, if these bosons condense, well, you know, w w in, in which particular single particle state are they condensing? And in general, the answer will be in some linear combination of Q and minus Q. And to determine the coefficients of that linear combination, you need to include the interactions. So unlike the previous case where we had a single minimum and it was clear, you know, you know, what was the single particle state, you know, where the bosons have to condense, here we will need to invoke the interactions in order to determine, you know, what is the optimal condensate, what is the single particle state in which these bosons want to condense. Now, the problem that I want to, to, to consider now is, uh, you know, an even more sophisticated case where, where you have six minima instead of two. Right, so we're, we had more frustration, more competing interactions uh, to produce six minima. And that, you know, for doing that, they will use a compound, barium manganese, uh, you know, to illustrate, you know, the whole thing. But uh, of course, you know, this is not, as I will show by the end of the talk, this is of course not the only realization of a single, you know, particle dispersion with six minima. You, you can have many different realizations. But in particular, in this one, you know, what happens in this compound is you have manganese 5 plus in this configuration. Manganese 5 plus has 2D electrons. Because of the Huns coupling, the 2D electrons are forming a spin 1. And, and because of tetrahedral coordination, you know, the, the lowest energy states are EGs. So basically, there is no Jan Teller or anything like that. I mean, you have one electron in each EG, you have a spin 1. And, and the strongest interactions between these pink ones are these thick bonds, right, these dimers. So to zero order, essentially what you have is, is a vegetable. I mean, you have a singlet. You know, the Heisenberg interaction is very strong on this vertical bond. So you have a singlet of two spin one in each of these bonds. But there is still an interdimer interaction. Um, and as you can see already, you know, if you consider only two dimers, you know, there is frustration because you have this parallel antiferromagnetic interaction that is competing against the crossed antiferromagnetic interaction. <laughs> On top of that, these dimers are forming triangular layers, so you have geometric frustration there, uh, right? And finally, uh, these, these, uh, these layers, these triangular layers are stacked in an ABC configuration, as you can see here, meaning that uh, you know, a manganese, for instance, here, that is in this layer, interacts, you know, the spin of the manganese interacts with the sum of the three spins on the, on the next triangle, right? So if you have a 120 degree configuration, you know, that is the ideal state for each layer, the sum of the three spins is zero. So that means that the interlayer interaction will be perfectly blocked. That means that we have then frustration of three types. You know, just, you know, parallel, parallel versus crossed, triangular layers, and then this, you know, interlayer interaction because of the ABC stacking. So uh, <clears throat> to, to, to understand, you know, you know, what to expect here, you can start with a single dimer problem, right? And say, well, you know, you have two spin one, they form a singlet, you know, because there is a very strong antiferromagnetic interaction in the dimer. And, and of course, the lowest energy excitation is a triplet, right? One plus one can give you zero, one or two, if you are adding two spin one. So you have a triplet here. And then you have the quintet here that will be the spin two excitation. So if you apply a magnetic field, now uh, then one of the three triplets, the SZ equal one, will go down in energy. And eventually, there will be a region of magnetic field values where you have only two low energy, uh, um, two, two low energy states, the singlet and the SZ equal one triplet, right? So once again, you know, we end up with a low energy manifold with two levels. We can use this kind of description. You, you can describe the singlet as the empty state, the triplet as the state occupied by a hardcore boson. So we can think that each triplet is a hardcore boson. And now we can project, you know, into this low energy manifold, right? And what we will find is that, you know, this triplet, you know, can hop. So basically, if you create a triplet in one of these dimers, it can hop from one dimer to the next one. But the hopping, because of the frustration, because of these you know, competing interactions between parallel and cross exchange, 
is proportional to the difference between parallel and cross. This, if you want, has to do with the opposite parity of singlets and triplets and the exchange of the two spins. So the Hopping goes like the difference between the two exchange, interdimer exchange interactions. And then there is also a repulsion between triplets that are occupying the same, I mean, nearest neighbors, simply because both interactions are anti-ferromagnetic, um, and, and the two triplets are pointing in the same direction, parallel to the magnetic field. So that the repulsion goes like the sum of the two exchange interactions, but the hopping, the matrix element for moving the triplet from one dimer to the next one, goes like the difference. And finally, uh, the chemical potential, you know, what controls the number of triplets, of course, changes linearly in the magnetic field, right? You start from a situation where it is negative because uh, you don't have triplets anywhere, but eventually you can uh, change the sign. You know, there will be a critical point where you change the sign of the chemical potential and you start having triplets in the ground state, as I described before for the saturation field. So, uh, if you go now and, and you know, the, so the, this group of uh, Matt Stone did uh, an inelastic neutron scattering experiment in, in, in the SNS, and they measured the single triplon dispersion. So this is a zero magnetic field. They measured the dispersion, indeed, of this triplon. Uh, this is a realistic dispersion, not like the ones that I was showing before. So it is gapped, right, because there is a spin gap at zero field. But, you know, from fitting this dispersion, you can extract, you know, uh, you can get information about, you know, these microscopic exchange interactions. You cannot get them all. You can only get these differences, right, because you are measuring a single particle dispersion, so you cannot get the sums. But I get, at, at least you get, you know, some information about the exchange interactions. Do you know the magnetization as a function of uh, uniaxial space? You mean in, in, in this material? Uh, no, but uh, so... You know, nobody measures the magnetization as a function of uniaxial strength, but um, you mean if you have magnetic field and uniaxial strength, yeah. or right? It is true that you know if you if by applying you you know pressure you you can yeah with uniaxial probably you know you will only separate the dimers, so you will increase the spin gap. But if you <laughs> apply pressure, you know, in, in a way that you can get you know these guys closer together you could induce a, a, a phase transition. So you could go from a, from a paramagnet, a quantum paramagnet, as this is, into uh, an antiferromagnet. It will be a different kind of critical point. Yeah, but it hasn't been seen. Not in this material, because here the critical, the gap, the spin gap is big. It's like uh, 9 Tesla, so it's 10 Kelvin, right? something like that. So, you know, it will take a very high pressure to close that gap in this material. But there are other materials where they can close, the, there is a material called thallium copper chloride, where they can close the gap under pressure, and then they can see the three gapless modes. You know, they can see also supposedly the, the you know, the, the, the massive diffusive mode, the so-called Higgs mode, and things like that. So, right, but in this material, it will take an enormous pressure to close the gap. And here I'm thinking, so there are, you're right, I mean, there are two ways of closing the gap. You know, one is increasing the, ext the relative strength of these interdimer interactions relative to the intradimer. The other one is to apply magnetic field. So in what, I, in what I'm doing now, you know, I'm applying magnetic field, so, you know, I'm, only one of this, these three levels is going down. In the case that you have in mind, the three levels will go down and eventually will cross. Because, you know, when you apply pressure, you're not uh, breaking the uh, SU2 th symmetry, right? So the story is that, you know, once you fit this, you know, dispersion, you notice that, uh, you know, at low energies, you know, the minima, uh, I mean, if you look at, at low, low, look at the low energy sector of this single magnum, this single triplon dispersion, you end up with six minima, right? So uh, if you look, you know, in momentum space where these six minima are located, I mean, they correspond to these yellow triangles, right? And, and the red triangles are these, you know, uh, high symmetry points, uh, you know, that I was mentioning before for the single triangular layer, right? So remember that, you know, there are only two inequivalent red triangles because these three are equivalent to each other and these three are equivalent to each other. So there are only two. But the point is that as soon as you include this interlayer coupling, right, you have a three-dimensional material, then all these red triangles shift towards the center 
of the of the virulence zone. And the reason is what I was mentioning before. Uh, the interlayer coupling is frustrated, right? So if if the ordering corresponds, you know, if the minima were at you know these red triangles, right, that will correspond to a hundred and twenty degree configuration. So the sum of these three spins will be zero, meaning that this interlayer interaction will be completely blocked. You, the system will not be gaining any energy from the interlayer coupling. So what the system does is it introduces some small incommensuration, right? That is the meaning of these wave vectors moving away from these high symmetry points, in such a way that now the sum of the three spins, right, is no longer zero. The energy, the interlayer energy gain, is linear in delta Q in the incommensuration, while the intralayer energy cost is quadratic, and that is the reason why you will always get a small incommensuration, a small shift, right? And you will end up now with six in equivalent minima, right? Because now once you know these points, these points shift towards the center of the virulence zone. Now these six uh, yellow spots are, are not equivalent anymore. So you really have six different minima in the single uh, triple on dispersion. And the question again is, you know, in which linear combination of these six minima are these bosons condensing, right? And as I said, for that, you know, we need to include the interactions. So uh, that's what I will do. Uh, you know, this is a Hamiltonian for, for a single boson, for a gas of bosons. This is the, this, the kinetic energy term. This dispersion has been measured with neutrons, so we know that very well. And now we need to introduce the interaction terms. There are two types, two sources of interaction. In, in the first place, these are hardcore bosons, meaning that you know we have a k-independent interaction, an on-site interaction u that I will send to infinity in this calculation. And uh, there is an, also an off-site repulsion. Rem remember the density-density interaction that was generated by the easing part of the Heisenberg interaction. So, so <clears throat> that's all you ha we have, right? And, and one big advantage of this uh, problem is that we will be working in the dilute limit, right? So normally when you are dealing with you know, quantum spin systems, you don't really have a small parameter, right? Normally you, deal, you, know, you do one over S expansions or things like that, but you know, one over S is, you know, S is not a big number when the spin is one half. So, you know, the approximation, you know, works in many cases, you know, because of reasons that are, you know, uh, that, you know, I will not discuss in this talk, but, you know, you don't really have a, a real control parameter. Now, uh, in this particular case, because we are working in the dilute limit, remember that, you know, when you cross this critical point, you know, you, the density increases, you know, from zero, so you really, close to the critical point, you have a dilute gas of bosons, there is a small parameter, and that, that small parameter is the ratio between the scattering length and the interparticle distance. So uh, when, the, when the density goes to zero, that is what, happen, what happens at this critical point, the interparticle distance you know, increases you know, <laughs> arbitrarily. And, and then you know, this lattice gas parameter, that ratio becomes arbitrarily small. And, and you can see that in that regime, basically, the only diagrams Right, that survive are these so-called ladder diagrams that if you want, they correspond to solving exactly the two-particle problem. If you want two-particle scattering dominates in that limit, as you can imagine, because you are in that dilute limit, so three-body processes are suppressed. And so, so what that means that, you know, if you want to develop a low energy effective theory, you know, for these gas opposals, uh, you know, you can do it under control, which is a situation which, uh, again, is not common, you know, when you deal with quantum uh, you know, uh, magnetic systems. Now, of course, you know, uh, in this dilute limit, you know, I will assume that my bosons can occupy either of the, you know, six minima that we have in the single particle dispersion. And if we are occupying, you know, one of these six minima, the number of processes, of interaction processes that are allowed by translational symmetry is, is, is limited. You can have, you know, density-density interactions in the same minimum between opposite minima, between next nearest neighbor minima, nearest neighbor. And finally, there is a term that allows to annihilate a pair of bosons with opposite Qs, let's say Q1 and minus Q1, 
and create a pair of bosons in you know Q2 and minus Q2 or Q3 and minus Q3. Right? These are all the terms that are allowed by, by symmetry. There is nothing else. And what one does is, is, is sum up these ladder diagrams you know, to compute uh, these different, the amplitudes of these uh, different vertices. Right? So <laughs> once you do that, then you, know, you can immediately uh, write down you know, the energy you know, you can replace the, 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 the bosonic operators already by complex numbers because we are assuming that the system is condensing. So if it is condensing, my bosonic operators become complex numbers. And you can think of these complex numbers as the coefficients, right, of the wave function. And that, you know, I said, you know, the particles will condense in a, in a linear combination of the six, you know, six different minima. In that linear combination, you have six complex numbers. So each of the complex numbers is, you know, it's param you know, it's parameterized in this way. So the amplitude scales like the square root of the density. And, you know, here this label n goes from 1 to 3. And you have plus and minus. So there are six amplitudes with the six corresponding phases. So, you know, once uh, we replace the operators by these z numbers, uh, you end up, you know, with this density-density interactions that I was describing before, the first four, four vertices. And you can see that the last one, that is not a density-density interaction, right, this process, is the only one that contains some dependence on the phase, on the relative phases of these uh, condensates, right? So, so what appears here is actually the symmetric combination of the phase for Qn and the phase for minus Qn, right? So this capital phi is the symmetric combination of these two phases. Uh, <coughs> And, and the magnetic field, you know, is basically is controlling the chemical potential. So, you know, when you reach, you know, the, this is a critical field. So basically when the magnetic field becomes bigger than the critical field is that, you know, because there is a minus sign here, you will start having, you know, these bosons in equilibrium. And again, you know, the interactions will decide, you know, in which particular state they are condensing. So uh, this is a bit of a technical comment. As you can see, you know, the only combination that appears here is the symmetric combination of the phases for Q and minus Q. But if you go to the next order, if you include three-body interactions, then you can see that uh, also now the anti-symmetric combination of the phases also appear, appears. And it depends on the, on, the ampli on the sign of the amplitude of this term. Uh, you know, depending on the sign of the amplitude of this term, you will get that the optimal phase theta here is zero or pi. So in the rest of the talk, I will consider both cases. I will show you results, you know, when the phase theta is zero or is pi, because you know we have not computed these diagrams, uh, right? But again, you know, it's the sign, you know, of this prefactor that will determine whether you get zero, zero or pi. So now what you can do is, you know, once you have this uh, this uh, landau ginzburg expansion, right? You can minimize the energy. So for each uh, combination of exchange parameters, you can minimize the energy and find out, you know, what is the optimal uh, state, right? And uh, I will not go through the, the whole phase diagram. You know, it will take a while. But you know, the the message of this slide is simply to show you that you know you can get many different answers, right, for different combination combinations of exchange parameters. Uh, this scheme. Uh, simply shows the amplitude of the of the of, of, of the or the parameter components on each of the queues, right? So for instance this will be a single queue state, you know, you only have you know weight in only in, in, in one of the queues, right? So the other queues have zero weight, right? Um, this is a double queue state, right? This is another kind of double queue state. This is a triple queue state. This is another type of triple queue state that appears in the phase diagram. But you know, for a moment, I want you to you know focus on this particular uh, multi-Q ordering, where you have exactly the same amplitude in the six different Q states, but the phase is changing by two pi over three. So that's the reason why I'm using different colors for these three circles. So, for instance, if the phase is zero for Q1, it will be two pi over three for uh, Q, Q2 and minus two pi over three for Q3. So the question is, you know, what type of magnetic ordering corresponds to this state that appears in the phase diagram? So when you go back to your, you know, to the spins 
and, and you plot uh, basically the spin components perpendicular to the magnetic field, what you find out is that corresponds to a vortex crystal. Uh, here, you know, this, this, this corresponds to the wave vector of the real compound, which is very close to the 120 degree ordering, right, to the commensurate wave vector. So basically what you get is anti-ferromagnetic vortices. What that means is that if you look at, you know, one triangle, you will see that, you know, these three spins are practically forming a 120 degree configuration. But if you would look at one sublattice, so you focus on one of the colors here, so the three colors correspond to the three sublattices, you can clearly see, you know, these vortices, right? And, you know, when you approach the core, right, the, the spin is, is getting out of the plane. So basically, it's, it's, in, in these regions, uh, you know, if you want the spin is, is completely parallel to the, or the pseudo spin is parallel to the magnetic field. Right, so that is what must happen in the near the core of a vortex. You know, the the, the order para the amplitude of the order parameter has to go to zero, and here the order parameter is the the planar component, right? the component of the spin in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. If you make the Q smaller, and you know this is something that you could do by applying uniaxial pressure. So if you increase the the strength of the interlayer coupling relative to the intralayer coupling. You can make all the cues, the six cues, smaller, and then you know you, you, you end up with a very with a simpler picture because you get essentially ferro ferromagnetic vortices, right? Uh, so you get this vortex crystal of ferro ferromagnetic vortices, and and this uh, you know this is a solution you know when where this variable theta remember it was the anti-symmetric combination of the phases is equal to pi, and the chirality is positive. By chirality I mean the sign of the cross product between two spins when, let's say, yes, I circulate clockwise around the core. So, uh, of course, because the Hamiltonian does not break any chiral symmetry, there are solutions of this type where the chirality is negative, right? So here, you know, S cross S is positive when we circulate clockwise. Here, S cross S is, is negative when we circulate clockwise. So this, these two solutions have exactly the same energy, right? And theta is equal to pi in both cases. But what is if, if theta is equal to zero, right? That, again, remember, is decided by a three-body term, by a three-body interaction. Well, if theta is zero, what you find out is that you still have a vortex crystal. It's still a triangular lattice. But the difference is that, you know, the triangular lattice can be divided into uh, <coughs> a three sublattices. So in Two of the sublattices, you have vortices. You know, what I'm showing here with the, with the contour plot is the phase. So every time you see a discontinuous change, you know, from blue to red, that means that the phase is changing by 2 pi. It's a branch cut. So you can see that, you know, in two sublattices of the triangular lattice, there is only one branch cut when you go around, you know, the point, this point, or this point. But in the third sublattice, you, you, you see two branch, branch cuts. So these are, let's say, vortices, and these are double anti-vortices, right? So you get the triangular lattice, you know, but now you have vortices in two sublattices and, you know, double anti-vortices in, in the third sublattice. And once again, this is what happens, you know, when you go to the small Q limit, right? So this will be the anti-ferromagnetic version, anti-ferromagnetic vortices. These are ferromagnetic vortices. So... Uh, by now, you, you may be wondering, okay, these, uh, these phases are nice, but, you know, the, the, it's a small phase in a phase diagram. Who cares? You know, you have to you know, tune a bunch of interactions. And, but, you know, there are two, two answers to that question. A weaker answer, weaker answer that, you know, I will give now, and then a second more important answer that, you know, you will, uh, you will have to wait for five minutes. So the first answer is that, you know, out of the 11 phases that appear in this phase diagram, seven, right, are some sort of vortex crystal. So, for instance, if you look at this 3Q ordering now, you you look in, 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 in the, you know, in real space, you know, how these spins look like. Now, instead of having, a hex, you know, a triangular lattice, you have a honeycomb lattice of vortices. So in this uh, sub-lattice, you have vortices. In the, in the other sub-lattice, you know, of the honeycomb lattice, the honeycomb lattice is bipartite, you have anti-vortices. 
So, and you know, what controls this distance, I have not mentioned before, but you know, essentially this, the distance between vortices or the lattice parameters, or lattice parameter of the vortex crystal is, is determined by the incommensuration. It's 2 pi divided by delta Q, where delta Q is the distance of the wave vector, you know, the, between the commensurate by Q, Q vector and the incommensurate Q vector. Uh, you, there are solutions, of course, that, you know, do not correspond to vortex crystals. For instance, if you have the 6 Q ordering, but the phases are the same for the 6 Qs, right? So they are not changing, you know, by 2 pi over 3. They are exactly the same. That happens if gamma 5, if that vertex is negative. Then you get a collinear ordering. You can see, you know, the spins are, the, the, the planar component of the spins is, you know, is collinear. Right, uh, but still the, the the amplitude of that planar component has the six Q modulation. So the six Q modulation appears in the amplitude, not in the phase. Now, going back to the question, right? You know how generic are these phases? You know it is. You know at this point it's very important now to remember. You know what I was saying before, that actually in any real material. Uh, you never have, you know, spin Hamiltonians with continuous symmetries. Today I was learning that there are materials where you have that to a very, very good approximation, where spin-orbit interaction is extremely small. Uh, but even if spin-orbit interaction is small, at least, you know, you have the dipolar interaction, right, that will notice, you know, the lattice and isotropy, right? In particular, uh, you know, in the lattice that I have been considering now, uh, you know, you have a six-fold symmetry, right? So you, you know, that continuous U1 symmetry that you have, you know, for a pure Heisenberg model in a magnetic field, in reality, you know, if, when, you, when you are describing a system that lives on a lattice, like a triangular lattice here, is replaced by a six-fold symmetry, by a discrete six-fold symmetry. And, and you know, uh, what that means is that, you know, the spin-spin interaction has also an anisotropic component, right, a compass-like interaction, like the dipolar. So if you now write that dipolar interaction or, you know, the symmetric exchange and isotropy that you can get also through spin orbit, you end up with this kind of term, right? Now you can create, you know, a pair of bosons with Q and minus Q or an equilater pair, right? And the fact that, you know, as you can see now, this term doesn't conserve the number of particles precisely means that, you know, you don't have a continuous symmetry anymore, right? Before, you know, the Hamiltonians that I was using we're conserving the number of bosons, and that's the reason why I, I was talking about, you know, bosons and condensation. Now you have terms that are ex explicitly breaking that con continuous symmetry. In the magnetic language, that is the symmetry, of the, con the symmetry of continuous rotations around the magnetic field. But you know, an important thing, observation here is that, you know, this spin orbit, this uh, symmetric exchange and isotropy comes with this phase factor, right? That has to do with the fact that the, the polar interaction is compass-like. Right, it's, it's an isotropic, but you know it's an iso You know the 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 the, the preferred axis is, is is the axis that connects the two magnetic moments. And here you have six fold symmetry, six uh, fold symmetry. So it's not surprising that you will get you know these three phases. You know again, you know zero e to the two pi over three and e to the minus two pi over three. And what is interesting, well, first of all, is that you know this term is quadratic. Is, is linear, linear in the in the boson density because remember that each of these operators scales like the square root of the density. So in the very dilute limit, this term dominates over the interaction terms, right? And it becomes relevant. Although the prefactor is small, it's smaller than the exchange, in, the symmetric exchange interaction. It is relevant because it scales linearly in the density instead of quadratic as the interaction terms. So once you minimize, you know, if you now minimize this term, right, in this variational space of, you know, uh, these six Qs. You know, the nice surprise is that you end up with only two degenerate minima, right? So, which are precisely the state of interest, you know, this six Q condensate that is a vortex crystal or a double Q state. So these are really the states that are competing, you know, close enough to the critical point once you include this anisotropy. And if in the phase diagram, you know, now this white line is basically, because of course, you know, now it's the interaction, the interactions will only decide between these two states, right? And this white line, you know, is precisely the, re the line that separates the region where this state wins, you know, according to the interactions, from the region where this other state wins. 
So now you can get this ordering, you know, with much higher probability because you know it's only competing against one uh, one alternative. So uh, so that is you know the more important uh, answer to that question. And indeed, you know, when you uh, go back to the phase diagram of this material, uh, there are two phases. So you know uh, you know this is the phase diagram in a magnetic field. This is for the field parallel to the plane, so it's not the most interesting orientation. Uh, but you can see that uh, right above the critical field, there is one phase, phase two, and then you know there is another transition into a phase one that occupies most of the phase diagram. So it is true that you know close to the critical point, there is another phase, as you know this story with the anisotropy may indicate. And uh, there is evidence, as I will show you in the next slide, that this is a single key ordering. So um, this is the angular dependence, right, of this phase diagram. So even when the magnetic field is along the z-axis, that is the interesting orientation, uh, you still have, you know, two phases, phase two and phase one. And for phase one, you know, from NMR measurements, it's pretty clear that this is a single Q-ordering. Uh, that comes from this double horn-like line shape of the NMR. So if this is single Q-ordering, that means that, you know, whatever you have here is a multi-Q-ordering. Right, and the question is, what type of multi key ordering? That is something that you know we are trying now to you know in in, in with Matt Stone and company in SNS, they are writing a proposal you know for measuring you know precisely what is this phase with the magnetic field along the z-axis. Apparently, it's not so trivial to do neutrons, neutron diffraction with a magnetic field with a magnetic field of nine tesla along the z-axis. Uh, just you know to 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 conclude you know the these magnetic orderings you know lead also to you know some magne microscopic magnetoelectric effects uh this for instance this ordering also has leads to a macroscopic magnetoelectric effect because it has a net ferrotoroidic moment so ferrotoroidic moment is the sum over all the sides of r the r is the position cross s and you can see that you know that is the anti-symmetric component of the magnetoelectric tensor. That means that if you apply a magnetic field now component in this direction, you will get electric polarization in this direction. But besides that fact, I mean, uh, you know, this kind of vortex crystals lead to a charge redistribution, right? So an epiphenomenon of this kind of vortex crystals is a charge density wave where you have you know more charge accumulated near the cores. Uh, <coughs> of the vortices. It's a small effect, of course. Another thing that you can demonstrate is that there are also diamagnetic currents circulating around these vortex cores. And that has to do with the fact that this is a non coplanar spin configuration, so the, the scalar spin chirality is non zero around the cores. So you get diamagnetic currents, electric currents circulating around the, these cores. Uh, uh, finally, you know, as I said before, you know, this is not restrictive, you know, of, of the particular system that I described. You can have, sorry, you, you, you can have, you know, uh, many other situations like FCC or VCC crystals that are frustrated where you will end up, you know, with multi-minima in the single boson dispersion. Uh, you know, again, you can play the same game and get different kinds of 3Q, 4Q, 6Q states that correspond to vortex crystals. The difference here is that the six minima now, these are cubic, you know, these crystals have cubic symmetry. So the six Qs are, you know, so you have two along X, two along Y, and two along Z. So they are connected by the cubic symmetry, not by a six-fold symmetry. So when you go and look at these vortex strings in 3D, you know, they do exotic things like, you know, you have, you know, three vortices that, you know, are recombining, are, are connecting on a given layer and then they come out. So they are not really parallel vortex strings. They come, they connect, and, and they come out. This is basically looking along the 1, 1, 1 direction of, you know, uh, of an FCC lattice for the 6Q ordering. So the vortex strings, uh, strings you know, they, they coincide, you know, some, in some layer and then they separate again. And you know, two of these are vortices, and one is an anti-vortex. So, just to conclude, um, clearly, you know, one of the big advantages of these particular incarnations of gases or bosons is that you can have frustration. You can frustrate the kinetic energy, and precisely you can you can naturally frustrate the kinetic energy. You can end up with single boson dispersions that have several minima. Once you have several minima in the single boson dispersion, you can have a condensate. You know that is a you know, particles condensing in a linear in a linear combination combination of the different minima, 
And in particular, you know, you can end up with these exotic vortex crystals that turned out to be favored, you know, by, by, by the symmetric anisotropy, so by the polar interaction or, or the symmetric exchange anisotropy that is induced by spin orbit interaction. So uh, the other important, I mean, interesting thing to notice is that normally because these vortex crystals locally break all of the lattice symmetries, you have charge effects. As you said, you know, I have not discussed that, you know, but the charge is not completely frozen in these mod insulators. You can have small charge redistributions or even electronic currents. And those effects naturally appear in these, you know, vortex crystals. Uh, so, you know, I would say, you know, this, this kind of microscopic magnetoelectric coupling is expected to be a generic property of, you know, this kind of crystal. So thank you very much for, for your attention. Yes, yes, you can make them 12. You, you can even, you're right, in FCC or VCC lattices, you can, you can make them 12, you know, if you, the minima end up being along, uh, you know, a, 